afternoon. Welcome to the Together North Jersey Institute webinar. My name is Blythe Thiemann. I'm the Director of Environmental and Sustainability Planning at the North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority. For those of you who don't know, we are the Metropolitan Planning Organization for 13 counties in Northern New Jersey. While the NJTPA oversees more than 2 billion in transportation improvement projects, we also provide a forum for interagency cooperation and public input. Together North Jersey is a partnership between the NJTPA and the Voorhees Transportation Center at Rutgers University. And today we're collaborating with Downtown New Jersey to bring you this webinar. The TNJ Institute sponsors a series of technical assistance and training activities designed to enhance the capacity of counties, municipalities, nonprofits, and others within the region to implement strategies from the Together North Jersey plan. Today, our speakers will talk to us about parklets and share some best practices related to making space for and building parklets, as well as introduce the TNJ updated parklet guidebook that we plan to release in the next couple of weeks. So to get things started, I'd like to turn it over to Courtney Mercer. She is the executive director of Downtown New Jersey, and she will serve as, a, as our moderator in today's webinar. Courtney. Thanks so much, Blythe. Uh, good morning and welcome. Oh, no, good afternoon now. Um, just a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Um, one, please feel free uh, to use the chat. If you have ideas or anything pops into your head, uh, share them. Um, you could also ask some questions there and I'll, I'll keep my eyes peeled. But just so you know, at the end, after we've had our, our presentations and moderated discussions, we will actually open up the webinar uh, and move everybody into the same room so that we can all have an open dialogue. So, you know, if you can't think of a question while it's going and you want to join that discussion towards the end, um, we hope it will be, be an open conversation. Um, so a little bit about downtown New Jersey. Uh, we are a statewide uh, education and advocacy organization all about downtown revitalization. Um, we do a lot of educational programming. This is uh, a part of that. If you are interested in other forums that we're doing, either we have past videos are up or future things that are coming up, check it out on downtownnj.com. Um, we also do a lot of policy work and we like to recognize our members. So if you don't know about us, please go check our website out and learn a little more. Um, so, just to kind of kick this off and get a brief introduction, um, parklets. Uh, I first learned about parklets back in 2013, 14. Um, I probably knew about them, but really started learning about them. Then, when Together North Jersey was happening, um, I happened to be working with Together North Jersey, doing a lot of the social media. Uh, that's why I have that social media post up there. Um, and we were working on this, this handbook. Uh, RPA was the lead working on this handbook for Morristown, uh, doing a demonstration project. Also familiar with, and some of you may have heard of Parking Day, which normally happens in the fall, where it's a global um, experience where people will actually build temporary parklets on that day to encourage uh, people to use them and, and discourage the cars. Um, my personal journey then transcended to Quebec. I was there in 2019 before COVID. Um, and as a good, dutiful urban planner, I took lots of pictures. Um, and these are just, this is a, a relatively small street where they had parklets and they were using them for a dining experience. You got to love the little cargo bike right next to the parklet to the right. Um, and then on a much kind of wider street and more prominent street, this is actually in the museum district and those lampshade lights are, are installations uh, to accompany the museum district. Um, they had much wider sidewalks. They were using the sidewalks for dining, they were using the parklets for dining. Um, and this is me enjoying uh, a parklet and eating despite it being an abomination to have square pizza. Um, it actually tasted very well, good. Um, so that was me enjoying, but we'll get into this a little later. There are some downsides and things you actually have to think about. And in this case in Quebec, they didn't have a, a proper loading zone. So they were actually going outside of the parklets blocking the wall. And we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, so then COVID happens uh, about, you know, less than a year later, and we go into panic mode and we need to accommodate our restaurants and our retail and our 
residents outside. Uh, this is an example in Jersey City, where I happen to live, uh, where they closed half the road to, to enable it. Um, they also put in some, some things to make sure there wasn't conflict between bikes and the parklets. Um, here's a bunch of examples of the early days of parklets when they're, they weren't constructed. You're kind of just figuring out on the street um, to today. Uh, where this is also in Jersey City and this is winter. Uh, it's constructed, the platform is at raid with the sidewalk to help with ADA. And then they put up these nice little um, sheds and they have heaters in them. I've eaten in there. Uh, it's called the Kitchen Step in Jersey City. If you've never been there, I highly recommend it. Um, two, uh, this was when I was at the conference, the APA conference in San Diego. You could see that the street on the right, you can see that it's an inclined street and they really went out of their way to make sure that this, they had a nice flat parklet. These are highly designed parklets. And on the left, you can see there's ADA ramps to get into them. So I just wanted to throw a few examples out there and you know how we got here today. So the manual is great. It is a great resource. Um, I, I the existing handbook um, and you can get to, I'll put the link in the chat later. Um, but we had people who were like, but how? You know, this had a lot of pictures. It had some very high level direction, um, but people really wanted examples and to know what other people in Jersey are doing. And so now that we have much more experience since 2014, that's why we're doing this, this uh, guidebook to supplement the handbook. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jacob to very quickly go over what's going to be in the guidebook. Um, thank you, Courtney. So, um... Yeah, like Courtney just mentioned, we've been working on an update to the 2014 handbook. And uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, we've, in the new the updated handbook, we're offering some updates and um, new developments in the parklet world that have happened over the last decade. When it's meant to serve kind of as a menu of sorts for people to see what's been going on, who's been doing what and where. And uh, we provide also some case examples of parklets in New Jersey. Um, we talk about some of the benefits of parklets, uh, tips for implementation, and also the effect that COVID-19 had on this recent surge in parklets. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, and so the also, the real meat, I guess, sort of in the guidebook is comes in the form of providing information on how different communities have been planning for parklets. So we go over some example ordinances and other technical aspects to navigate, such as legal language and um, just other things that communities have been doing. Um, and yeah, that's it at a glance. Um, thank you, Courtney. Great. Thank you, Jacob. Um, so, like I said, uh, please feel free to use the chat to share your thoughts, commentary, questions as we go, and we will open it up at the end um, and bring everybody in for a nice discussion. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to get us started. Uh, today, we have uh, four great panelists. Um, Mayor Andrew Nowick from the City of Lamberville, Chris Bernardo, who's President and CDO, CEO of Commercial District Services, James Ribato, who is the Director of Operations from Arterial, and Ryan Sharp, who's Director of Transportation and Parking with the City of Hoboken. And I'm going to now turn it over to James to kick us off. Excellent. Thank you, Courtney. So just quickly, just an introduction again on myself, uh, James Ribato, I'm a Partner and Director of Operations with Arterial. We are a full service collaborative street design studio. We're comprised of designers, landscape architects, planners, uh, and creators. And it's really our mission to create evocative spaces that encourage social interaction, connectivity, and economic vitality. And specifically, obviously in the, in the world of street design. And, and this is where my experience has crossed paths with parklets and it's that vibrancy and that unlocked potential of certain streets that we're trying to get at uh, where sort of our paths ha have crossed and this is i'm going to share a little bit of that with you and then go into some uh, examples next so first question i think we should ask is what is a parklet next and just you know from a terminology standpoint the term parklet was really first used 
it was back in 2005 in San Francisco when there was a couple of people who were really doing an experiment and they converted a uh, parking space into a mini park for a couple hours. They literally fed the meter to the max that they could. They rolled out some sod, put a bench and a tree in it, and they observed to see what happened. And it really was an interesting thing because it was this unlocked, unused area that then started to get populated with people sitting down and eating lunch, you know, hanging out in the shade that the tree provided. And it really spawned what became a, a sort of a worldwide event called Parking Day, which, which Courtney alluded to, uh, that really that's where it came from. Next. And, you know, we had different reasons for them. You know, this why parklets you can see here why there's there's not enough space you know there's there's places that have that energy that have that vibrancy uh with people eating outside and 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 dining and walking and, and traversing but the sidewalks are are, are tight so you know we, we have to figure out how to um maximize that space so that people can continue to uh you know expand upon the things that they're doing next you know we we looked at spaces like this that normal day uh were just cars and really you know thin sidewalks that people could not put furniture out on that people couldn't get their chairs and tables out on and as we you know dove into street design and, and got into different projects parking day was just happening so that we're going back to like 2009 uh 2010 and so we kind of experimented with parking day and Next, we literally created platforms ourselves. We put the screws in, we carried them out there and we put it down on the street, put a bunch of furniture and saw what happened. And, and all of a sudden people started to congregate. People started to stop and, and have lunch outside of these eateries that were there. And it created this interesting um, paradigm shift that happened because there was nothing here the day before. And then all of a sudden to everyone's surprise, there was, there was some space and it got used and then it got taken away, next. So that organic and, and vibrant energy, you know, we, we saw in a few different places. This is in, in a, on another street where we put a piano in the street and people were walking out and playing the piano all day long. And, and, and you know, there was even an interpretive dancer that came out and, and hanging out. And the biggest thing that came out of this was there is this untapped desire for these spaces that these streets currently, you know, didn't provide and people were excited about them. But next, then we rolled it up and we took it away. And the, the question was, uh, where did, where'd it go? You know, when's it coming back? You know, what's going on with that? And it really started to inform from our perspective, some some things that we could do from a street design standpoint and actually redesigning these streets. And, and that's kind of where these projects went. Next. Uh, again, we see this all over the place where you have a space like this, next, and it can be this. And a lot of times, and, and, and this is gonna be talked about later, it's really getting uh, uh, behind it than, than you know, we had back in, in, in 2009, it was just really just kind of, we were doing it, just throwing it out on the street. We didn't have any guidebooks. We didn't have any, any guidance. It was just our, our knowledge from our, our professional training that we started to put into practice to try and figure these things out. And there's been a lot more now uh, information. Uh, and I think that this guidebook is, is something that's great and, and can continue to move us forward. So uh, next slide. So a parklet can really vary based on a few characteristics. One is the location. It can occupy parking spaces, street medians, traffic uh, triangles, uh, repurposed travel lanes, parking lots, any excess area or irregular uh, intersection you can use to put in a parklet, which is, again, what we're trying to do is get that vibrancy and that space. Um, land uses, oh, sorry, yeah, land uses usually want to be in, in a certain place, and I'm going to go through some of this quickly, but uh, the shape, this is what I think is interesting. They don't all have to be linear or square. They could be rectangular, triangle, ir, uh, triangular or irregular. They can last from a few hours. Again, this happens every year on, on parking day, but then there's the sort of cyclovias, Sunday streets, open streets, uh, to one day, uh, which is parking day, to part of the year or year round. Next. So now uh, after years of, of doing this, a lot more data has been collected, as been alluded to, and we have 
design considerations and things to consider as we potentially look to um, put these parklets in place. Uh, NACTO, which is the National Association of City Transportation Officials, uh, defines parklets as um, public seating platforms that convert curbside parking spaces into vibrant community spaces. And that's what we're after. We're after the vibrancy of our, of our spaces. Uh, and then furthermore, um, they, they make mention of accommodating this unmet demand for public space on thriving neighborhood retail streets and commercial areas. So we have things to consider, like what's the purpose of the parklet? Is it for eating, outdoor eating? Is it for additional seating? Is it for additional sidewalk space? You know, we didn't take ADA accessibility into account in a lot of the early forms of these, of these uh, parklets. And now that's something that we want to make sure that these are accessible to everybody. Safety is a, is a big thing that we, you know, are constantly learning about. And you'll see in this uh, graphic, there's a dimension there. We don't want the parklets necessarily to come full eight feet of a parking space or to stick out in traffic. Uh, you know, we want them to be a little bit tucked in so that they can be protected by the parked cars on either side of them. They can have barriers. They can have objects that are visible. Uh, visibility is obviously very, very important. Location, where are we putting them? And that might make you know, the needs of that parklet different. Uh, and then design, you know, and, and the design, you know, we could, we could be very creative about. And again, I, I should move quickly. So let's go to the next slide. So some quick examples, this is just showing where additional sidewalk space was, was needed. So you can see the buffer that's created on the, on the left with this planter that blocks the, the traffic from the additional sidewalk space that's created. You have to think about things like drainage, um, next where we're looking for additional public space and public amenities. You know, in this case, you can see that this is a covered space. Next slide. With seating inside, different types of seating. This is the kind of flexibility that people are looking for. They can, you know, they can lounge on those, those sofa chairs. They can eat their lunch at the tables. Next. I really like these, so I just figured I'd show another slide of those. Uh, next. Uh, in, you know, and again, these are all over the world. This one's in England, but this is, uh, to support the the cafe seating that was already occurring on the sidewalk, so it gives a little more additional public seating, but also brings some planting bike racks that are integrated into the parklet. So again, getting that uh, space for street furniture uh, and and those things that the sidewalk currently is is too narrow to to uh, accommodate. Next, and you know what we see a lot of, which is additional sidewalk space to accommodate. Uh, cafe tables, chairs, outdoor dining, which is, has become so popular. Um, next. So just going to hang out on, on this one project for a minute. Uh, this was a street design project that we did down in, in Ventnor City. And this is a great example of how we can take what people are looking for, understand the purpose, what they want, and deliver when it comes to design. So this stretch uh, was their commercial stretch. There was a few restaurants in the area and not all restaurants want the parking taken in front of their uh, uh, establishment. There were a couple in this area that we, next slide, we showed them what we could do from a street design standpoint. We can do new pavers, you know, new street trees. We could do some small bump outs. Um, but if you would like, and we took a parking space and, and uh, go to the next slide, and created you know, a platform, we can essentially expand your outdoor dining. And to our surprise, most of the restaurants in this area said, yes, let's do that, next. And so the next series of slides shows how they've really taken advantage of that, next. Here you could see they've put up a, a barrier with planting and they have all this additional uh, space for these tables and chairs, next. So you can see how they're really packing in those tables and chairs, next. And you can see this just uh, you know above from an aerial that from an economic vitality standpoint, it has really helped a lot of these restaurants, especially uh, when it came to COVID. So my time is up. I, I know that was fairly quick, but um, I'd like to kick it over to uh, the, the mayor now and, and uh, to talk about Lambertville. Hello, everybody. Uh, great, great to be here today. Thanks for offering me the opportunity to speak about this. Uh, Lambertville, in case you don't know, is a city in Hunterdon County. Uh, it's a fairly small city, 1.2 square miles, population about 4,000. And uh, our central business district was uh, was laid out in the late 17th and early 18th century. 
So we uh, didn't have a lot of urban planners back then, I think. Uh, and uh, so we're always confronting a little bit of the restraints uh, of, of, a, of a downtown business district like uh, like we have in Lambertville. We have very narrow sidewalks and often, often in places there are setback issues. There's uh, always been uh, the challenge of parking, which is, a, which is a great challenge to have because it means lots of people want to visit. Um, but uh, w w one of the couple of things I just want to emphasize about parklets, you know, in 2018, before COVID, the city got a uh, got got some money from the state uh, community development fund to construct a parklet, which is uh, pictured here on the left. I'm sorry, I don't have an actual picture. This is an old uh, Photoshop photo. Uh, we've got the parklet going out this week. We had Shad Fest last week, so I'm a little late with the with getting the parklet out. But uh, so, so we had our first parklet uh, installed in the city in 2019, and then uh, we added a second one in 2020, which is uh, here on the on the right. And, and these spaces have been incredibly important to, to, to the business district. It's amazing what uh, one's what the loss of not the loss, but the, the gain of one parklet taking taking one parking space and turning it into a place where people can actually stop. And look around and have a seat and reflect on kind of the you know the scene all around them uh it's been a, a, a remarkable addition to the city and, and our parklet uh you know we we construct it uh and uh, we've moved it around the city in several different places over the over the last three or four years to sort of find you know depending on the year where it may be best suited so uh this year it's going to return to the same spot it was last year which is right on north main uh, north union street kind of in the in in, in the the prime location uh, in front of a in front of a gourmet cheese shop. So uh, it adds a tremendous amount of value. Very very happy to have it. And and then the second one was just uh, you know it's uh, again very simple just uh, application of putting some chairs and a table in an otherwise uh, kind of unused public right of way uh, adjacent to a bank. Uh, and that as well just gives people the opportunity to stop. And uh, you know we often get you know musicians guitarists kind of hanging out there. Uh, and and uh, it adds a lot of uh, adds a lot of vibrancy uh, to James points. So um, these have been enormously successful in, in the city. And I think that uh, you know if you're a small city uh, or a small town uh, with with uh, you know space constraints or even financial constraints, you don't necessarily have to have uh, a planner. You just need to be able to kind of develop uh, a little bit of space where you can take advantage of of uh, you know of adding something to the community. Uh, next, and then, and then I would just notice that note in the 2020 that we were awarded an economic development grant by Hunter and County to to expand and diversify our permitted uses within the commercial districts. Certainly, when COVID hit, uh, the city did its best to be sort of nimble and proactive in terms of our restaurants, uh, and so we did have a number of streeteries even before we had an ordinance, uh, and it all went incredibly well. Uh, and then during that time, we had a couple of roundtables with business leaders in, in, in the city and really looked at ways in which we could increase uh, pedestrian usage uh, and uh, and just kind of functionality of, of, of the downtown. So in 2021, we adopted some uh, some amendments to uh, our outdoor dining code. And for the first time ever, we included parklets, sidewalks, uh, sidewalk cafe and streeteries. Um, streetery was very popular. We still have one or two places that uh, that will add a that will add a streetery every year, and these are right downtown. And for a small restaurant who's willing to kind of you know expand out into one or two parking spaces, it has enormous value, and uh, it also has enormous value in terms of slowing down the traffic. Uh, you know, it's, as I said, it's a very congested uh, kind of tight road uh, in our in our central business district. So. You know, people are going slower, sort of engaging more in terms of, uh, you know, oh, what is that? Uh, it's a streetery. So uh, that's just a little bit about kind of what Lambertville has done. Certainly, uh, if anybody's interested in sort of seeing our uh, ordinance that we crafted uh, for this, I'll put my uh, my email in the chat box and you can certainly uh, contact me. I'd be happy to send you a, a copy of that. So, um, you know, we're, we're very bullish on kind of an approach to sort of imagining the city in different ways. And I think that a parklet and the, and the cafes, uh, streetery is all important ways for us. And we've really evolved into something that's uh, that, that's very nice and, and friendly and a lot more engaging uh, here in the city. So and with that, I think I'll turn it over to Ryan um, and I'll see you all in the Q&A. Thanks. 
Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it. I love that Hoboken gets to play the big city role here uh, <laughs> for this webinar today. Um, my name is Ryan Sharp. I'm the Director of Transportation and Parking for the City of Hoboken. Uh, I'm going to walk through briefly uh, Hoboken's outdoor dining program. We use parklets in Hoboken uh, more as an extension of, of our outdoor dining program than as a public space uh, per se, as James showed earlier. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Hoboken launched uh, its parklet program as part of uh, its COVID-19 small business recovery strategy in 2020. Um, so basically we used uh, our COVID state of emergency powers to, to launch the program, um, something that we had been wanting to do for a few years previously, and this forced our hand to do it and do it quickly. We put together the program in about two or three weeks. Um, and uh, basically the way we structured things, we, we provided two options for uh, businesses that wanted to have a parklet or something that looked like a parklet. Uh, one was a traditional parklet, which we've been looking at mostly today so far uh, during this webinar, built mostly out of wood planking and has a, a firm back to it. Uh, it's much more substantial structure that I would call semi-permanent. Uh, these are expensive to build, though. They can cost anywhere from $10,000 to $50,000 or more, depending on how elaborate uh, they are. So there's a high upfront cost at the, at the time that was uh, difficult for some bus businesses to handle uh, as we're, we're kind of in lockdown. Um, the way we structured that was that we charged a fee for reserving effectively space within the public right of way every single day because these structures were, were semi-permanent. They were not being moved. Um, so people, uh, applicants uh, who had a permit had to uh, pay a fee basically uh, daily for 30 days per month. That's how it was calculated. Uh, we considered the parklets to be a more hassle-free option because once they're built, it's kind of set it and forget it, and you can just operate within that space. Uh, we also offered this thing called streeteries, um, which was a more flexible style of a parklet, uh, more cost-effective, right? So you didn't have to invest in uh, building the parklet up front and um, if you were a business that only wanted to operate one or two days per week, you know, during your peak business time um, or a few hours a day or whatever, uh, you had the flexibility to do that. We would only charge a fee based off of the amount of days that you, you actually used that space. Um, and there was no upfront cost. We worked with our special improvement district to get standard materials, water flow barricades and turf uh, that would be delivered to any um, applicant that um, wanted to use a streetery, right? So they had the materials, they just needed to store them overnight and take it down every day, right? Uh, but then you, know, hey, you had to face the operational challenges with storing the materials and then uh, compliance with, with parked cars not moving from those spaces each day. We had special signs uh, to help with that, but it didn't always work perfectly. Uh, we peaked at about 50 plus parklets and streeteries uh, in Hoboken over the last couple of years. And then in 2022, City Council uh, made the program permanent by ordinance. Uh, next slide. Here's a few examples of the parklets that, that are some of my favorites. This is the first one that was built in Hoboken uh, about one week into June of 2020. This is Anthony Davids on 10th Street. Next. Uh, this is Elysian Cafe, also on 10th Street. For some reason, we have a lot of parklets on 10th Street, which is a very narrow street in Hoboken. Um, but uh, yeah, this is, this is two different perspectives. You can see people are, are, are using them the second that they were built. These pictures were taken uh, days after construction was completed. Next. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, 10th and Willow. Uh, in Hoboken. This is a, a larger one in terms of linear space. Next. And then this is uh, 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 Napoli's Pizza. Next. And this is the biggest one in Hoboken. Uh, this is uh, 13th and Washington Street. Um, it's a double wide because there's uh, reverse angle parking here. Next. And you can kind of go through these every two seconds or so. This is what a streetery looks like with the water-filled barricades and the branded signage and the turf to try to uh, soften up the, 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 the ground and, and make it look like a green space. Okay, next. And then in terms of permitting requirements, 
Uh, you have to apply for a permit. The permit's good for one year, January 1 through uh, December 31st. There are clearance requirements. For example, you can't have the Parkwood or Streetery within 25 feet of a crosswalk for visibility issues or 10 feet from a fire hydrant. They can't be built over gas lines. Uh, there's a maintenance bond requirement of 15 feet per square foot in case they're abandoned. That gives us the funds to go and remove them so you don't have an abandonment issue, which New York has been having. Um, and then my last slide. Uh, in terms of fees and, and revenue impact, just to kind of give that perspective, we started by charging $2 per square foot per month in 2020, and that generated about $169,000, $170,000 of revenue that year. Um, that went to $285,000 in 2021 as more parklets and streeteries came in line. Uh, and then in 2022, um, council adopted the ordinance and added a, an escalation for the fee uh, each year to keep up with uh, inflation and so forth. Almost a half a million dollars came in in 2022. Uh, and this year we're charging two, 250 per square foot per month. And, and in terms of parking impact, uh, there is sometimes a perception that these are taking up a lot of parking spaces in Hoboken, but in reality, it's about 66 parking spaces out of about 9,000 citywide, which is less than 1%. So uh, that's, that's Parklets in Hoboken. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and uh, I do want to acknowledge uh, uh, First, that Ryan's program in Hoboken really did set a standard, especially early on in the pandemic. Um, and so uh, uh, a lot of the things that they did there was very important. Um, my name is Chris Bernardo. I'm the president and CEO of Commercial District Services. We manage business improvement districts in Hudson County and Essex County. We also provide outdoor cleaning services uh, and public safety services to those districts. And we get the opportunity to work with parklets uh, a good amount, uh, not just parklets, but also supplemental seating. And I thought it would be a good idea to uh, kind of make a distinction between the type of extended dining that Ryan and others talked about and also public parklets and supplemental seating because um, the original intention of this type of adoption of the roadway was to create really vibrant districts. And in some cases, uh, we're not quite achieving that. And really the difference has been management. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is what an area can look like if it doesn't receive the type of careful consideration and management that was described all throughout uh, these presentations. Uh, this is in Lower Manhattan, uh, where uh, uh, structures were allowed to get put up with very little guidance. And really, the, the, the big issues that we saw here were curb management and issues related to garbage, drainage, and unfortunately, rodents. Next. Uh, this is... Uh, you know, and uh, I, I, I promised uh, to uh, sort of be the contrarian here today. This is uh, unfortunately um, what a place looks like when um, there isn't uh, a lot of uh, uh, planning that goes into uh, this type of adoption of the roadway. As you can see here, uh, there are structures put up very quickly and uh, we have garbage building up around those structures. Uh, there's not a lot of thought going into what's happening behind the structures, and people have encountered all sorts of problems, including uh, the inability to put garbage out, uh, the inability to get deliveries, and uh, it has been really problematic, uh, especially in Lower Manhattan. Next. Another issue that uh, we're, we're seeing in a lot of these structures is uh, flooding and pooling of water, uh, which has also added to the rodent issue in these areas and has become really problematic for businesses, residents, uh, and property owners. Next. And the result here is added cost. Uh, this is a, a, a photo or two photographs of our crew pressure washing and disinfecting in and around these structures to uh, try to mitigate some of the problems 
uh, including um, rodent feces and, and everything else you can imagine, which uh, occurs in an area that is relatively uh, unregulated. Next. So there is a little bit of good news, and uh, I do want to point out that uh, not everything has to be done uh, to the max. It doesn't have to be expensive. Uh, it's really about finding the right opportunities for supplemental seeding and also identifying the true needs of a particular place. Uh, for those places that are not fundamentally destination dining locations, the needs might be slightly different. And so uh, in our case in Journal Square in Jersey City, uh, we came across an opportunity during the pandemic where uh, we had an, uh, a lane of traffic that was actually supposed to be a turning lane that uh, unfortunately wasn't really a turning lane. It was really more of a parking area for employees of local businesses. And uh, we thought that there might be a good opportunity here to treat uh, a few different issues, including providing additional seating for our businesses. Next. And so, as you can see here, this is the same lane of traffic uh, where uh, we've now been able to create uh, a large supplemental seating area that's able to service not one business, but multiple businesses, five, six, seven different restaurants that are relatively close by. And we've created additional seating that um, wasn't available to people before. We've also been able to uh, add to the beautification of the streetscape um, in, in converting that. Next. Uh, the same space uh, where we have supplemental seats also doubles as an area for a farmer's market. Uh, so now you have uh, you know, an added community benefit uh, for that space. Next. Uh, the other thing I also want to highlight and underscore is we probably need to take more advantage of the uh, laws that are already on the books, things like uh, cafe seating. Years ago, it was difficult to get people to pay $250 for a, a cafe seating permit, but today people are willing to spend five, six, seven thousand $7,000 for a parklet. So times have definitely changed. It's important to find where these small opportunities are for supplemental seating. Uh, bump outs within streetscapes certainly can serve serve that. Next. Uh, also, uh, finding opportunities within our mid-block passages and plazas and putting seating in those areas. These are areas that already exist, but in a lot of cases are underutilized. Uh, so it's it's really important to be able to identify those, those places and take advantage of them. I would just conclude with, uh, once again, management here is really key and making sure that uh, we're getting out ahead of things. That was the advantage that, that Hoboken had, getting out ahead of, of um, the need for supplemental seating very early on in the pandemic and doing the type of planning that's necessary. Jersey City also uh, doing the same. We were beneficiaries of that great planning and it made it possible for place management organizations to be able to do the work that we do. So with that, uh, Courtney. Thank you so much, Chris. If we can have Ryan, Andrew, um, and James join me too, and we will we will go uh, uh, Brady Bunch style to begin our conversation. So that I can see my questions. All right. There we go. Uh, so I think that was great. I think it was a great primer. Great, great to set us up. Uh, we already had questions coming in, which is, which was nice. Um, so we wanted to uh, talk about and get get everybody's feelings a little bit more about, you know, why you do a parklet and the differing goals between, you know, straight up placemaking versus safety versus economic development or all of the above and kind of just perspectives on, you know, why, why and where you should put something um, based on those goals. And I don't know who wants to kick that off first. Uh, I can take a stab. Sure. Um, and, and I'll half answer one of the questions in the chat too, um, with, with my response, hopefully. Um, so, you know, what we found in terms of purpose, um, in general, there has been this push 
right, back towards downtowns, there's been this experience that can only come through strolling a town, walking its streets, finding a place to eat at, grabbing something and, and sitting out, uh, you know, outside, whether that's, you know, dinner or an ice cream cone or whatever it is, that can't be replicated at a mall or, or in different places like that. So I think COVID um, sort of accelerated, obviously, the, the, the need for some of that from an economic standpoint. Um, so I think the purpose, there's a, there's a lot of different purposes depending on, um, you know, what is going on. But from a general standpoint, there is this desire for downtowns to kind of get back to that vibrancy that they had. And that, that's an experience, again, that can't be replicated. So uh, whether that is more dining or whether that is just more space, because Sometimes our, our, you know, as the mayor indicated in, in Lambertville, our, our sidewalks are narrow and there's not much we could do about it, right? The, the, maybe the financials of expanding are, are too, you know, too great. And so that there's tools that we have to bring that vibrancy, to bring that energy uh, and parklets are, are one of them. And we worked in Bloomfield where we built, you know, a parklet, demonstrated it. And it, it you know, the idea was loved. But the municipal engineer didn't love the idea because from a safety standpoint, he just he just honestly couldn't wrap his head around it. And this again, this was years ago. Um, I think we have more data now. But what what they wound up doing was actually shifting some money that they had in their capital budget from elsewhere to be able to expand the sidewalks along their whole commercial stretch so that they could fit the outdoor dining and seating. And so in that case, parklets were used as a tool to you know as a catalyst really to get them to expand their sidewalks move some money around and and give people the ability to get additional seating and that kind of thing so um municipal engineers it depends which town you're in and their comfort level their experience level their you know the data that they have so uh, that's going to vary every place that you go and i think that data is where we fall on we you know it's not my opinion or my thoughts it's experience and the data that really helps uh engineers understand you know this kind of thing and and the safety requirements and things like that so i'll i'll stop there if you want to jump in on this one the 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 goal and kind of having a goal in mind before you <laughs> before you just do it yeah i mean it's um it, it's really important to have a, a plan in place and to make sure that you're incorporating the needs of those that are going to be around this this structure, if it is a structure. I mean, um, I think one of the things that we saw in New York is um, when business owners are sort of left to their own devices and they're putting stuff on the street and there isn't public intervention, uh, you sort of get what you get. And so it's important for uh, everybody to be able to buy into to why you would want this. Obviously, vibrancy uh, is something you're definitely going to get. We were able to prove in Jersey City that you're getting way more participation from pedestrians, or you're getting more value from pedestrians using the parklets than you are from having a single car in a parking place, for sure. Um, it's just uh, making sure that everybody's on the same page about how how the um, how the parklet should be used. I'm a big supporter of public parklets. Uh, or public supplemental seating that can be really flexible and can be utilized by a broad range of people, not just uh, a singular business. I think that that's where you really do get the economic development um, boost because you're improving an entire block uh, in that way. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, James is right. You're going to get uh, different municipal engineers are going to look at things differently. Liability and safety are always going to be an issue. Um, and so it's not it's not going to work in all places. Uh, we have a location in Newark where uh, a parklet was widely accepted by a group of restaurant owners, but at night they had issues with vandalism uh, and um, uh, pieces of the parklet getting broken. And then ultimately they decided that they would prefer just to scrap it. So um, it really does depend on the environment that you're putting it in. Ryan, you unmuted yourself. Did you? Oh, it, Mayor, go ahead. I see you. Yeah, I, I was just going to kind of piggyback on, off of uh, Chris and James. Certainly, I think it's important for uh, mayors, uh, planners to take a look at their communities and, 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 and ask themselves where they can do better and, and what that 
you know, what that means for a community in terms of whether it's, whether your goals are strictly economic development or just bringing more people in or making it more pedestrian friendly. Uh, um, and so, you know, that's something that we're always thinking about and always wanting to kind of improve uh, in our town and, um, and and have a little bit of imagination while you're at it. Uh, and then just in terms, I saw there was a question in the, in the chat about kind of funding parklets. Uh, certainly there's grants out there, you know, we're always applying for every grant dollar we can get in Lambertville, and that's probably true for most municipalities. Um, so, so, you know, we found that there's been a lot of support in the broader, you know, among broader um, uh, organizations for support of these kinds of re-examinations and parklets and infrastructure changes. So um, I think you just have to kind of get out there and really, and really look for it. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll, before I go to Ryan, I will piggyback on that. AARP, um has their living livable communities grants the this year's round is already up but that's always a good source for these type of small ones um some places have art councils so either the county or something like that um will be able to fund them and then yeah you know obviously lambertville was able to take advantage of was it dca or eda one of them EDA, I think, um, and the county had some funds. So definitely check out, you know, all of those resources and we can keep, oh, and apparently Sustainable Jersey PSE and G grant just popped up in the, the chat as well. So go ahead, Ryan, anything to add on this um, goal making or goal setting? I think it depends on the context of your community um, and of each individual street, right? So uh, if you're looking to uh, increase the vibrancy of your street and you have a lot of restaurant density, then, you know, maybe having uh, parklets or, or streeteries that expand that footprint makes a lot of sense. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't have both, right? You can sprinkle in some that are for public space and some that are more uh, kind of privatized, right? Uh, it really depends. Um, and, and in terms of uh, how do we pay for these things, right? So, uh, leverage your special improvement district if you have one um, try to get them to help contribute to some degree because it's a benefit for the merchants that are part of that uh, you know special improvement district um, and then you know i'm always going to make a pitch for reinvesting uh revenue that you're getting from your parking meters right use that money if you can to help pay for uh, these improvements that are streetscape benefits that add vibrancy to your street and that effectively bring more customers back to these places where you're charging those fees, right? So it's a positive feedback loop. Um, and that's something that we do often in, in, in Hoboken with, with decent success. Great, thank you. Let's play on that um, context conversation a little bit. Uh, are there different types of parklets that work in better or worse in different contexts? Obviously, we already have a, a, a bigger city, obviously, Hoboken's still a small city, but a bigger city, and little Lambertville with its tiny little narrow streets, then we have suburban places that might be thinking about it. Um, you know, just thoughts on context and, and how you determine what, what works best for you based on your community. I think um, at least what, what ha has seemed to work best for us is um, focusing more on uh, adopting underutilized areas and providing supplemental seating as opposed to assembling parklets per se. Um, because once you put that structure in the street, uh, it does become a liability in terms of drainage, uh, making sure that um, there's not they're not too close together. Um, it, it does make a difference in different communities. Some communities are way more conscientious about taking care of part of those structures. Um, but uh, we've found that having the flexibility of just being able to put tables and chairs out, supplementing it with planters, uh, and then building off of that. I mean, when people see the success of one small space, you tend to see other people make the investment themselves. Uh, that's, I think, one way that uh, the special improvement district can be a catalyst for further investment. Um, but I just uh, I, I've 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 seen enough issues with structures in the street to where um, I'm, I'm very hesitant to uh, to recommend them in in most communities that that don't have already good infrastructure in place to be able to maintain it. And what I mean by that is 
good public management, uh, good rules and regulations, and um, stakeholders that are going to be particularly conscientious about what's going on in and around the structure. I'll piggyback on that. Chris makes some really good points there. Um, and things that we've learned over almost three years now of having this program, uh, the details matter in terms of what your requirements are in your application process, right? Specs, um, design standards, uh, making sure that drainage is not negatively impacted, making sure that there are not uh, safety hazards created by the structures, if, if you do have structures, right? Um, making sure that there are uh, there aren't nuisances coming from, from the structures, right? So you don't have huge TVs that are, uh, you know, creating light pollution at night if people live above, you know, a restaurant or they have, uh, you know, loud music playing from speakers, you know, during a, a basketball game at night or something like that. Because um, they can attract, sometimes they're a victim of their own success. They can attract 20 or 30 people potentially. Um, and, and we've seen uh, businesses design them. So it's like a, a small table with like, you know, five or six stools around them. So it maximizes the capacity. Now that we're kind of beyond the six foot, you know, separation requirements, you could have 30 or 40 people in a small parklet, right? At any given time uh, being served, you know, alcohol, right? So all those details matter to avoid quality of life issues. Um, you know, having uh, an inspection capability so that if the structure doesn't meet a standard or other public health, issues with not cleaning them properly, which leads to rodent issues, um, or they just deteriorate over time. That's why you have a permit process that has to get renewed annually. Um, so they don't deteriorate after two or three years. And then, you know, then what happens? Who's responsible, right? Uh, and then having a maintenance bond, right? We did have one or two people that, um, two, one or two permittees that either abandoned their, their parklet or they stopped paying for it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so over time, we had to make a decision how to deal with that. And we had to eventually remove them. We had to pay to do that. So having that maintenance bond requirement up front allowed us to do that, to remove that uh, blight or potential blight, which you saw in some of those pictures that Chris provided, uh, without adding more cost to the taxpayers. So. That's interesting. I wonder with that bond, if you could actually pay to move them, is there, no, is there another restaurant that could use it? <laughs> And then they save money. There's some like trading well, of, of park. That, 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 it's an interesting point. We, we try to get them as part of the application process. We, we work with, they have to submit architectural drawings by a, a licensed architect, right? So it's like a real thing. Um, and they're reviewed by our city engineer, by me, by uh, our zoning officer. Like we have multiple layers of review to make sure we're covering as many bases as possible or potential issues that could come up. Um, and that maintenance bond requirement came out of you know, learning through that process where we had a gap. Uh, but we do try to teach them, if you're going to build it, build it in small sections, right? So that if you ever have to move it because we're repaving a road and you want to put it back and not lose out on your $40,000 parklet investment, you can use uh, you know, a small piece of machinery and disassemble it in small sections, store it temporarily, and then bring it back when you, when you need it or relocate it somewhere else. Um, so, so it can be, you know, re reutilized elsewhere. So that's Good my point. point. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, yeah, oh, I, I, ahead, I, if I may, uh, yeah, I think that uh, I think that you make some great points, Ryan. Certainly, we have a permitting process, uh, lots of regulations involved to make sure everything is done the, the, in the appropriate way and uh, with oversight from the city. Uh, our our parklet and streeteries are only allowed to be on. The on site from uh, April 15th to November 15th. So uh, we clear out our, our parklet, uh, you know, our, our parking space parklet uh, in November, uh, and we ask the restaurant to do the same. It's important for us to be able to have access to the snow plows and everything else that happens during the winter uh, when the seating is not, uh, not, not very practical in a city like Lamberville, which, you know, doesn't allow, you know, these vast enclosed spaces uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the parking spaces. So uh, yeah, having regulations in the permitting process is key, uh, and it's key to having that uh, well defined in your ordinance. Uh, and, and just to, um, I, th I don't know, I think it was Chris's uh, or James about supplemental seating. You know, I think that that's another area where a lot of municipalities can easily get some wins, right? You know, you may have a space that has a bench that could actually accommodate a table and four chairs, and that really changes the dynamic of that small space, right? Bench, you're just sort of looking out at people, a, a table and four small cafe chairs. You're, 
you're engaging and you're, 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 you're activating space in a completely different way. So again, you know, coming from the small city thing with where our spaces are tight, we really try to look at every little place where we can get that sort of engagement and, and kind of re-examine what the space could be as opposed to what it's been traditionally. Yeah, if I could also hop in, I, I think, the, you know, the, the sort of question, just going back to the, the origin of the question too about location. And I, I think that there was a point where some towns or some communities sort of rushed hopping on the trend of parklets to try and get a parklet somewhere without, you know, some of this consideration that I, that I think the mayor's talking about, that Ryan's talking about, and put it in a place that almost from day one was going to be a failure because of where it was placed, you know, and um, that then obviously causes a detriment on any future installations or, you know, because you've, you've sort of shown it fail in a way. And, and what I mean by that is I've seen communities where they really wanted to have a parklet. Um, I'm not sure if they just saw pictures, if it was something that they were reading about or heard about and put it in a spot where not many people walked. It wasn't near any kind of, you know, eating establishment. And so it was really just vacant. And so then it was looked at as a, a sort of a wasted effort. And then it becomes even more difficult to, uh, you know, further that like, hey, maybe there is a real need over here. Um, so I think the location, like you're like you're saying, is super important, and it really needs to be thought out and not rushed. It's better to really think it out than to rush it out there, because then you're doing you know twice as much effort the next time uh, you try and get something uh, on the street. If I could just respond one to to one point, though, yeah, I think the location is really important, and we, as I mentioned earlier, we took our parklet, uh, the city's parklet, and tried it in several different places. And one place we tried it, it was just breath you know it's just brutally hot because it was in the sun all day and, and another place was just a little bit too far out of the central business district for it to get any real traffic and the place where we ended up putting it is right on uh, you know one of the main blocks under a beautiful locust tree you know in front of a cheese shop and we're convinced that that's the best spot for it in terms of traffic and and use and and uh you know bringing attention to it so it's important to know what that space is and, and to be and to recognize that I think that's where tactical urbanism comes in, especially if you're doing it for extra seating, you know, public space, extra seating or or a space to hang out is where you do this temporary thing you use, which, by the way, was in the chat and JTPA's uh, Complete Streets Lending Library. You can borrow some turf, borrow some benches, borrow whatever, give it a try and see if it works before you go and spend the money on the wood and the, the, the permanent um, installation. Um, obviously, if you're extending a restaurant, then you want to be across from the restaurant, but, you know, for these public ones. Um, so speaking of, we, it's come up uh, several times in the, in the chat, um, curb management. So, you know, loss of parking, dealing with deliveries, bicycle pedestrian interactions. And I want to kick it first to Chris, actually, because it also comes up county state roads. Um, I believe where, one, you took a turn lane, which is... <laughs> A little bit, I know people were parking in the turn lane, but it is a designated turn lane, right? Um, and I believe, was that on JFK? Is that actually a county road that you did that one on? Oh, no, it was local. Okay, so you didn't, didn't deal with that. Close, but close. It was close. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, talk about taking a turn lane um, and, and, and you know, this curb management in, in the place when you're doing these. Yeah. Well, I think there's, there's two, two highlights there. One is, obviously, Jersey City had the, the foresight similar to Hoboken, to take advantage of, uh, of these opportunities. And uh, we owe uh, a great deal to them getting out in front of this early on and, and doing that. Um, and it made, you know, it made all the sense in the world to, to do that. Um, we don't really run into too many curb management issues there because it's still a relatively open space. So we still pick up garbage on a daily basis in and around that block without uh, any any issues. Um, uh, in terms of traffic flow, it's not any worse than it was when people were illegally parking in that lane and then turning into the 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 other lane and creating you know uh, a traffic congestion. Uh, traffic still flows. Uh, if if anything, it flows better there now. Um, but curb management definitely is a consideration, and that really does speak to the long-term plans, right? So 
one of the things that we can achieve with these small improvements is giving people sort of a sense of what is possible, doing it well, and then starting to build the case for um, more modern, better streetscapes and traffic patterns uh, in our downtowns. Uh, it's super important. You know, you look at places like Milburn uh, that put in really, really modern, uh, uh, flexible spaces, and it was it was a it was a, it was hard for people to accept when 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 it first happened. But you know, maybe if there was more investment in time showing people the, be the, the, the long-term benefits of it, you know, maybe it would have been accepted a little bit more, a little bit more easily um, than what had happened there. I just feel like there, it, this is a long game. I'll give you it, it, my example on Bergen that we just talked about. Um, it, it, it's not specifically because of the success of this, but it definitely, I think, played a role. Um, they are going to be doing a full curb extension uh, into the street there and, and actually creating um, a, a more formal space with all the proper drainage and everything else, which is another, I think, important piece to this. If we can make these spaces work and we can show people that by reconfiguring the streetscape and maybe doing green infrastructure, you know, everything can kind of come together, incorporating loading zones, incorporating third party drop offs. It requires a lot of work and also requires us reconfiguring a lot of our, our streets and our, our streetscape. And I'm probably getting out of my depth here with James on this call. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll kick it over to him in like a second. But I think, that's really the, I think that's really the big win here is, are we doing things that are demonstrating that the value of making those bigger long-term changes? Yeah, if, if you, if, thanks. Um, uh, you know, that's a, that's a huge point. And, and I think that just speaking on demonstration projects and things like that, what we have found is any permanent change, right, alters people's behavior and how they use a place. So whether that's, you know, on their daily walk, whether that's on their daily commute, how they access a place. Uh, and if you aren't showing the benefit when you demonstrate something, Let's just say you just put up a bunch of cones to show like, hey, we could we could narrow lanes or we could set up seating here. And, and there isn't that visual of what that benefit is. The community is much less willing to buy into it because they're only seeing the headache. It's like just looks just like construction. Whenever there's construction, that's you can see a road narrowing. It's, it's great. Right. But it's all traffic and cones and there's nothing there that's a, a, a community give back. And so it does make it more difficult long term to get people to buy in versus, you know, if you're going to if you're going to do a demonstration, if you're going to do a parklet, take the extra time to do it right. Figure out the right location. So like the mayor was saying, maybe before you actually and I'm not I'm not you know saying, you, you know, you did anything wrong here, mayor, but maybe you, you kind of figure, hey, we should have some shade or this is the shadiest spot, you, you know, and this is the place where it should be. And then you put it there and hopefully it, it's a win, because sometimes you don't have the the sort of political willpower to to make it through a a wrong spot you know and then that may end you know your your experimentation and potentially long term benefit by by doing um some of these things so uh i i see ryan that you've unmuted so i'll i'll i could go on forever on this kind of thing so i'll i'll kind of let you jump in here and Ryan, whatever your point is, plus parking, because we know parking is a premium in Hoboken. So when you take away parking spots, that's that's you know a big deal. Yeah. Of course, I mean when we, when we talk about curb management, I think you have to look at the curb lane, right? Uh, which is a dynamic place. It's not just for parking. Um, and I think when I say dynamic, the needs and the and, and the desires of the community and the needs of, of a particular street change over time pretty rapidly, right? Uh, you look at the demands that we have now in terms of delivery traffic, uh, in terms of food delivery, uh, freight delivery, uh, bike share, um, bus lanes, bike lanes, uh, mobility hubs, parklets. I mean, there's so many different competing uses for that curb space. And I'd be willing to bet that if you were to design most main streets in New Jersey or anywhere, again, from scratch, and there were no regulations there, and you're just like, okay, what's best right now for today in 2023, at least half of every block would not be for parking. 
And that would be what the community wants, right? Not what the mayor or the planner or the engineer wants or anyone like that, because businesses want to have uh, seamless deliveries for their goods. They want to have dedicated places for, uh, you know, um, food delivery pickup, which is a huge percentage of, of business traffic now in a lot of places. Um, you know, people don't people want to see orderly traffic flow, not double parking or parking in a bike lane or things like that. Um, and then people want to have vibrant streets, right? And they feel that when you have a parklet, whether it's public or whether it's kind of uh, private as an expansion of your outdoor dining. Um, so when you mix those uses together, you end up with curb management that has to be right sized for each community and their needs and their demands. Um, and, and you try to do the best you can to make all of that work. And I think parklets in this context are an important part of uh, kind of the modern context for, for curb management and, and is a, would probably rank really highly if you did a survey in every community in every downtown in New Jersey and beyond, you know, if you rank, put all those uses there, parking, loading zone, uh, parklet, you know, mobility hub, things like that, I bet you parklets would rank in the top three pretty much everywhere. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, I, a little on parking management, I want to say the example behind me uh, in Quebec, so there were probably 16 parking spots taken up on this stretch of road uh, with, with parklets. And then beyond that, they actually had just 15 minute parking, 15 minute meters so that it wasn't this, this battle over, they expected people to walk here. And or if you were coming here to drive, you were in and out to pick up whatever it is. Um, clearly, although the trucks, they still hadn't figured out the loading and unloading for the trucks. But depending, again, context on your community, sometimes double parking is not a bad thing. Um, sometimes it slows down drivers and they're more conscious and it's actually better for the, the pedestrian experience. Oh, Ryan doesn't like that. But, you know, um, so, but that is something you got to think about. And, and, and along with that, even if you provide it, then there's enforcement. So it's one thing if you have loading zones, but then you just let people park in the loading zones, then you've you've defeated the purpose. Um, so I think we've gotten to the part of the afternoon where Kate, if we want to let people in, um, so we're 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 um, letting you all in. Please raise your hand um, before you speak. And while that's happening, um, let's see if I can come up with a one of the questions that that came up. Um, let's see, grants, county roads. Um, talked about parking spaces already. Someone had a question about, and this is a design thing, using a modified cargo container as a parklet in an off-street parking space. Have we have we seen that? Um. I'll just, uh, it's funny, I saw that question and I thought about one of the slides that I showed of, of a park that up in Boston. I think something that's really critical is your visibility and transparency. So one of the, the images that, that Chris showed of, of New York City, you know, creating this sort of like tunnel that these cars are going through is, to me, it, it, you know, you're I think you're creating a, a really unsightly, unpleasant drive for whoever might be in a car. Um, I think you want to be able to see from one side of the street to the other. So that the example that I, I had on the screen, you know, the not that it was a, uh, you know, sort of a cargo container thing, but the, any of the, you know, things that you couldn't see that weren't transparent were low. And then, you know, the the top of it was very transparent so that you could see through. I think that that's, uh, to me, important consideration. You just have to look at that image that Chris showed to know that, like, we wouldn't want to replicate that. Um, and from a design standpoint, it's it's important from the economics of the street that as you're strolling down one side, you want to be able to see stores on the other side and then, you know, know to, to you know, get to the next crosswalk and go there versus if we're blocking these storefronts, that's going to inhibit that, you know, that environment of strolling around, spending more money, spending more time and the visibility of our, of our businesses. So I would say it really depends on whether or not you're going to be blocking people's views. Great, thank you. Yeah, when I saw that one picture of Chris's, I was kind of actually thinking, those of you who have watched The Last of Us, it felt a little post-apocalyptic uh, that people had built shacks to, <laughs> to live in. Um, it does, yeah. It, and, and by the way, it, it, it does feel that way. 
uh, when you're experiencing that, you know, it's, uh, it, it definitely detracts from everything that you're trying to achieve there. It's focused on one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to service that particular business, um, which is moving away from the original concept. Um, which, yeah, Chris, if I could just jump in on that again, is none of these parklets should be thought about in these isolated cases. It's, it's the environment, it's the overall context that you're looking at that we should be thinking about when it comes to design, you know, and again, my background coming from street design is we're, we're looking at the way the whole thing works. Uh, and, and if we get too focused on one thing, then some of those things are going to start to happen, you know, because you're not taking into account everything like parklets are a tool that may be helpful, may be appropriate, but are not the only thing that's that's happening. Like Ryan was, you know, and Chris were talking about curbside management. There's so many other things. There's a there's somebody in the chat saying, you know, scooters and bike parking and micro mobility and all this other stuff. All of these things are working together to enhance your experience, to create vibrant downtowns that work, that function um, and that people enjoy. Thanks. Does anyone in the audience want to raise their hand and ask a question? If not, I can keep keep going off of what was typed in. Um, there was some question. There was some discussion about uh, SEPTED, which is con uh crime prevention through environmental design and then some discussion about unhoused um and i think this is probably a slightly more urban context uh and probably not something that you only deal with in parklets but pl public plazas public parks etc and is there you know a sweet spot or a management um decision without being you know overly forceful uh that that these things can coexist, uh, public parklets, public parks, et cetera. Uh, and, um, you know, issues with, with unruly people sometimes. They're, they're going to coexist there. It's just the reality, you know, in, in urban communities. And I know, um, like in, for, like in Hoboken with Panera and Starbucks deciding to, you know, uh, close their dining rooms. Um, you, you're going to see more of that over time, uh, and this is not this is not a discussion about homelessness. But you know, obviously, until we have a national strategy in place for how we're going to assist the unhoused, uh, municipalities are going to continue to hold the bag, and it's going to flow down to management organizations like special improvement districts and every other institution that has some level of public space management responsibility. So there's no there's no easy solutions to it. And on top of that, I mean, we're calling them parklets for a reason, right? We're talking about uh, additional open space or public space. And uh, these are issues that we're going to deal with anywhere where we have a park or a plaza or open space or public space. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think it's fair to blame parklets or streeteries uh, as further exacerbating um, some of these challenges we have with public safety or, or, or the unhoused um, that we aren't already dealing with, right? And so, as Chris mentioned, um, you know, these things can coexist and they should coexist. We need a more comprehensive strategy to deal with these issues across the board, not just for parklets. I just, before we keep with the dialogue going, I know mayor, the mayor has to jump off at his Arbor Day. He has to go meet with some, some youngins. So we wanna, you know, if you wanna say good, final words of goodbye before you hop off. Actually, the, it's raining here, so I just oh. got a word that the Arbor Day is postponed until Monday, so I'm happy to oh. just oh, great. Wonderful. So no final words. <laughs> no final Not yet. Words. Any thoughts of, you know, uh, additional parkless space? If, if we are in, you know, the SEPTEP model or this, this uh, equity model of, of being very proactive and using parklets as a way to green and provide additional open space in, you know, uh, uh, traditionally disadvantaged neighborhoods. Um, is that something, I don't know, James, you've, you've done the things all over the place you've thought about or towns are thinking about using them for that purpose? You know, uh, it's interesting. I think I'm going to step back and, and sort of go with a, a general response in terms of, of SEPTED. And I think that it's a lot of times it's a person's perception. So I, I can't get into what everyone's experiences are personally and how they feel when they walk down the street or whatever and what makes them uncomfortable or not. But 
we can we can provide the best environments that we can if we make sure that sight lines are really good, that there's lighting, that there's visibility, that um, you know, taking away a perception that somebody may have that like, hey, somebody could be hiding behind there. It may not, it may never have been the case in, in a particular town that somebody hid behind a bush. But if you can't see and you have preconceived whatever's that I can't control, if there isn't something that somebody could hide behind, then that goes away, right? Uh, or it minimizes it. So just from a general standpoint, I think that visibility, sight lines, lighting, like all those things really help perception of safety that that everyone has a different you know comfort level and and again that that's that's a lot to get into obviously but i think generally speaking i would kind of you know put the bar there that it comes to the way that we design things and that again that permeability and transparency is, is always very important courtney Thanks. we have a, we have a hand if i may uh, it's will yarzab i posted the okay i'll let you, i was going to let olivia go first because she was up first but you can oh. go ahead go oh. ahead will Olivia, very sorry next. about that <laughs> uh so my comment about septed uh james just answered it beautifully in, in a sense that it's a holistic approach someone's perception clearly those pictures from manhattan with those structures blocking everyone's view it's going to create a bunch of shadows which is going to be a pedestrian safety issue as well as a uh if there's potential crime there if people do have if there's video surveillance simply for a police officer walking the beat won't be able to see to the other side of the street because of all those structures you cannot see through them so i appreciate that holistic you have to everybody have everybody involved and let them uh, give their advice uh, thank you very much i think a lot of us even can experientially say that we feel more comfortable in the ones that are more open like i when they have that like corrugated plastic stuff i just feel what's the point then i might as well go inside but anyway go ahead olivia Hey, thanks. Um, so I know a couple of you guys. Um, we are in Burnsville, and um, like many towns in the, we have a highway running through the center of our town. Um, and this is one of my biggest, I don't know, goals, I'm going to say, because uh, we have people around town in a space. Um, and we, we, from RideWise here in Somerset County, and which is really great, but we had it at our farmer's to just kind of show people what it would be. I couldn't put it in any spot. I would not be able to put it in any kind of spot on our main street, if you will. Um, so to do a parklet, like, would it still be the same kind of concept if I put it in a hot parking space? Or are we, are we talking about like a green structure or do I need something different here? Because our again, our biggest concern is this very unsafe main street. <laughs> I'm trying to help our businesses, and even yesterday, I would say I, nobody walks anywhere in this town. So I I wanted to create that kind of gathering environment, but we just don't have the space for it. So how to kind of get around that in any way? Or did I just stump everybody? <laughs> uh, yep, here we go. The mayor has. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have anything cheerful for, for to say about this. Uh, you know, we have a, you know, on Bridge Street in Lambertville is uh, Route 79 uh, overseen uh, jurisdictionally by the DOT. And, uh, you know, we've asked repeatedly for a park lit on Bridge Street uh, and, uh, you know, have not been able to to get a permit for one or to get, or to get one. Um, so I I feel your pain and your frustration with uh, with that. Um, and I wish I had an answer for you, uh, other than to work within. You know, if, if the sidewalk is wide, possibly work within the kind of the existing framework that you've got, where you where, where you don't necessarily need uh, that permission. But uh, maybe James or Chris uh, might have a better answer. I also have an answer. Uh, Cause Olivia, I think you're, are you a bid yet? Officially a business improvement? No, issue? we are, uh, we're in the throes of the lovely, you know, back in, but hopefully in the next couple of months, we're working on that. We are also the town's working on transit village designation, okay. but that's so, not yet complete either. Gotcha. So I put a, yeah. and we'll go to Greg and Jason after this. I put a uh, case text, a, a, a piece of, legislation, whatever, statute, statute in the chat. Oh. So people who have business improvement districts can actually work 
around the state. Um, and this, uh, Bob Goldsmith likes oh. to bring this one up a lot because this is how they got parking on Route 31, 33, 33 in Robbinsville um, using this okay. statue. So those of you with bids, um, and I think some of the bids have put this in their, their parklets and their open streets and all that when they do it and say, this statute says okay. we can do it notwithstanding whatever the state says. So, so everybody Which check is, out that statute. <laughs> that's awesome and really helpful. My concern before, as, before we continue, my biggest concern is that we have 18 wheelers flying through the yeah. center of our town. Yeah. So it's, it, it's, so that's a bigger day, thing with the yeah, state. It's the yeah, the issue. Like, all I want to do is build a truck route somewhere else that goes around our town. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> can we just get those big giant things out of here? It's just, it's scary. And, and people don't walk around because of that, I think. So, and your summer set, talk to Walt. Maybe you can get a freight study. This, yeah, let's talk well, offline. I tried to connect with him. Yeah, let's, let's do talk it. offline. Cool. Okay. Good. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Did you have something else, James, um, before we go to Greg? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I want to, I want to try and help Olivia not not leave the conversation with a too bleak of a of an outlook. Um, you know, I think um, obviously there's 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 greater challenges when you have a state road when it's got major trucks like that. But it, you know, I think that there are things that can be done. The the first thing is if you could reroute the trucks, that's a home run. That's a whole thing in of itself. But uh, it's worth it yeah. in the end. Um, but it, you know. Work, and working with the state is not easy, but what we've found working with, with the state and it kind of, to a lesser degree, the county uh, or different counties, um, it's a little more persistence and, and sort of hitting it from different angles. You never take no for an answer, right? When, right. you know, yeah. we, we were working on a, on a state road that runs through somebody's downtown. Um, typically people say, oh, if you want to even put bump outs in, you're, you're not going to get anywhere. And that's not necessarily the case. You know, there are people in the state that are coming around and have seen some of these things and you just have to keep sort of attacking it. We put mid block uh, uh, bump outs for a crosswalk in, on a state road. We've painted a bump out on a state road. Um, and all those things, if you could start to do some of those things, it's gonna help slow that traffic down. You know, it's gonna help slow those trucks down. The, 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 what trucks need is they need things to be tighter that they can get through, but they can't get through as quickly. Um, and that's then going to make your walking experience better, which then hopefully will increase safety. There's a, you know, it starts to, it starts to trickle a little bit. Um, and, and I do think that again, depending on, on where we've looked at parking lots where we can find, you know, whether it's traffic, you know, the, the, the islands that are in there or different ways to reconfigure a parking lot that we can get space for public seating, or, you know, if it's, if it's restaurants that have access from behind you know you can you can capture that space back there for them for the outdoor seating um so there are definitely things um and and you know we should probably connect then uh there's definitely things that, that can that can be done that sounds great let's let's do things i i don't want to take no for an answer because if this town wants to do all the things they say they want to do uh we need to kind of get over those hurdles so you know that's let's do it all right <laughs> thank you Thank you, Olivia. Let's go. We've got four hands up now, so we're going to go fire round. Uh, make your question as tight as possible, and then maybe we'll go to try to maybe keep it to one person. So, Greg, I had seen you next. Thanks, Courtney. Um, my name is Greg. I work at VTC with the, um, and I just wanted to ask if the if any of you had come across uh, interesting ways to integrate green infrastructure in streets where you're implementing parklets. Because as we know, in New Jersey, a lot of cities are now in risk of annual, like severe flooding with climate change. You know, a hundred year floodplain used to be something that, you know, was a minor, a little bit less of a risk. And now it's a, it's a regular risk. Great. So I don't know uh, if Ryan or James wants, James wants to take this one. I know Ryan, you're doing a lot with uh, resiliency and if it's in there. Yeah, we haven't packaged in green infrastructure as part of the parklet program per se, uh, but we do have a, a very strong complete streets program. It's been around for over a decade. And I think that's kind of the precursor to having a good parklet program in a lot of ways because uh, having a complete street, a street maybe that has bump outs on it, for example, that's the foundation for uh, dedicating space for other uses like parklets, right? Um, so if you have a good complete street already built, 
that's an opportunity to have green infrastructure kind of front loaded as part of that. And then you add on a parklet on top of that. And now you have a great place making kind of hub, so to speak, where you have that new public outdoor seating and you have the green infrastructure and it looks really good put together. And there's a couple of places in Hoboken. Um, and, and I had one picture uh, in there near the end of my parklet presentation where there's a, uh, uh, an intersection that had been improved with uh, green infrastructure, curb extension rain gardens. It's a corner, corner building, it was a uh, pizza store. And then a mural had been painted on the side of the building. And then the parklet went right next to, or was built right next to the green infrastructure to those bump outs. And when you look at the sum of all those parts, it's just a dramatic transformation in terms of uh, before and after. And there's a real benefit there in terms of drainage improvements uh, and resiliency. So hopefully that answers your question. Do you have anything to add, James? Yeah, I mean, Ryan, that was that was perfect. And the one thing I would add is also when you start to talk green infrastructure, that opens you up to a different pool of dollars that's out there, grants and, and stuff like that. So coupling those things together can really be helpful from a financial standpoint. Thanks. Jason, I had you next. Yeah, um, thank you for uh, popping that link in the chat for the state statute. Um, what about in the case where you are looking to circumnavigate your municipality? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean to laugh. <laughs> it wasn't that funny. I've been working on it for a couple of years now. I know. I know you yeah. have. Uh, James, any advice? You've worked yeah, in a lot of communities. <laughs> oh, wait, is he also the consultant for the municipality? So we can't can't jump to him. <laughs> I mean, just just to continue to kind of laugh and go. The thir first thing I thought of, Jason, when you said that was that's what tactical urbanism is all about, right? Yeah. That's. Um, but it, I mean, it, it's it's difficult, and again, I, it, it's one of those things where some places just aren't ready, and it just it takes extra data and selling and and precedents and and physically visiting places that have done these things you know to to get people to understand how it's working in other communities and that it, it can work and that it's not i think one of the one of the most important things is having uh, the mayor and ryan on here is that you know it's not it's not the wild west so to speak anymore like when when parking day first happened in 2005 and when uh you know when we were putting some parklets out there uh it, there was nothing really done before like that but now there are there are places that have these ordinances that have things in place that that can be shared and i think that's super helpful um for for communities yeah. we can build parklets in lambertville and hoboken and jersey city right these are three of the densest downtown communities you'll find with very narrow streets and and, and pre-industrial um you know building structures right then anywhere is you, you can do it anywhere right so um, yeah, do a delegation day, pick three cities and go travel around, pick a suburban location and show um, that they're, they're there, they work, um, you know, reach out to, to people who are here today, get a copy of, of the ordinances that have been passed by city councils. Um, and, and then, yeah, tactical urbanism, start there, start small, put a piece of turf out there, feed the media yourself. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, what are they going to say, right? Well, I think that's not necessarily, and I think James can attest to this too. We, um, I mean, our master plan has called for a parklet program since 2014 or 15. Um, and in fact, uh, the work of our organization and, and a couple others in town, we actually got a, a really nice uh, parklet uh, ordinance and application passed uh, about a year into COVID. Um, the only problem with it is um, 20 G's in escrow for a parking space, um, and, uh, and an application that's actually physically impossible to build in a, in the size of our parking spaces, uh, that was drawn up by our engineering team. Um, and so they, ha they have all the, all the benchmarking and all the ordinances, and that was all presented to them and put together by us over a, a, a series of a years long's worth of meetings. Um, it's, it's more about I think they just don't want it actually. So that's hard. And maybe Sounds it's a like grassroots green swell, a, a grassroots groundswell. Like if the people, the residents, the bills, businesses ask for it, maybe, I don't know. We could talk offline and okay. <laughs> strategize. 
Yeah. Really I was along. thinking maybe maybe you had some other like awesome silver bullet like this uh, <laughs> like this ordinance you just uh, or statue you just posted. But thank you, Ryan. Did you have something quick to add? Because I do want to get. We no, have I, was, just I, was, I was saying it sounds like a very unique circumstance, and I you know reach out to us offline so we can figure out where we're talking about here and, and how we might be able to help. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. So we have one more, Dorian. If if people don't mind going just a couple minutes over, um, would you like to ask your question if you're still there? Yes, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi. Okay. I don't know how to get it off speaker, but um, I just wanted to bring up the green infrastructure. Chris Abrupta has been doing some under drainage, uh, and he had done one in Milltown, the borough of Milltown, which is Middlesex County, and the school could rarely utilize the back area for an outside school. So they did an under -drain, drainage for green infrastructure and solve that issue. So that might be a consideration with the parklets in doing combination of the green infrastructure under drainage in order to solve those issues. And definitely there's a lot of green infrastructure uh, grants out there. I keep getting more and more emailed to me. So they're, they're out there. <laughs> Thanks. Um, with that, I will hand it back to Blythe to uh, sign us off. Very great. Thank you so much for um, all these questions and engaged conversation. Thank you so much to our speakers for their time and sharing their experiences and their expertise with us. And thank you all for being part of this TNJ Institute webinar. For more information about Together North Jersey, please visit our website and we will post the slides and the video of today's webinar there. So um, you can check that out and then play, please stay tuned for other future events that the Institute will host. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>